I'm Emily, and Jake, who is two years older than me, is a science enthusiast living his childhood dream with a research job. He seems fulfilled despite his busy schedule. Our son, Mike, is three years old, sharing Jake's love for observation and experimentation. Currently, he's fixated on the goldfish he caught at the fall festival. Our daughter, Sarah, at one year old, is a delight with her chubby cheeks and love for food, bringing comfort and joy to our household. Life seems pretty good for our ordinary family, except for one recurring issue, dinner. As I was trying to calm down my crying daughter and finish dinner, the doorbell rang. Without hesitation, my mother-in-law entered our home, a familiar occurrence. Though not always on the same day, she tends to show up around this time frequently enough that Mike hardly notices. More fried food again. That's not good, so oily. You need to take better care of Jake's stomach when he comes home tired from work. It's not good for the grandkids either, she remarks, as she begins setting the table with the dishes she brought. But Mike really likes it. I defend weakly. That's because you only feed him junk, she retorts. Look, I've made a creamy vegetable stew and minestrone for you. It's important for the kids to get used to Western food from an early age. With large containers of stew and minestrone, she sets the table enough to last for days. I feel a pang of disappointment seeing the stew, mostly carrots and cabbage. Come on, stop daydreaming. I'll take the food you made home with me, she declares, we can't waste food. This routine has become all too familiar. Last time, she replaced my clam chowder with her fried chicken, then left without much acknowledgement of her grandchildren. As she leaves, my son's sad face tugs at my heartstrings. Don't worry, there's a little bit of meat left. I reassure him, but inside, I'm frustrated. This intrusion has become unbearable over the past year, her unannounced visits during dinner prep time, her criticisms, and now taking our food home with her. I can't imagine her living alone since my father-in-law passed away, consuming all three servings. She's probably throwing it away. As I cook baby food and try to distract the kids, I can't shake off this feeling of dissatisfaction. Growing up in a family that owned a restaurant, I learned to cook from my dad, and I'm confident in my culinary skills. It's frustrating to have them negated by her overly sweet cream stew. But with Mike in the picture, I've struggled to stand up to her. Jake arrives home after the kids have gone to sleep, making a face at the sight of dinner realizing that only Mike's share of fried chicken remains. I serve Jake a large platter of the cream stew, feeling resigned to the fact that it's what my mother-in-law always brings over. What can I do? If you don't like it, you tell her. I mutter, hoping for some support. Yeah, I guess, Jake replies, poking at the stew without much enthusiasm. He's always been non-committal, especially when it comes to confronting his mother. She shows up without considering Sarah's nap time and even takes away Mike's favorite foods right in front of him. Well, she's lonely since dad died, Jake offers, as if it's an excuse. That was two years ago. How much longer do I have to put up with this? I bent, feeling exasperated. Jake is usually reliable, but he avoids confrontation when his mother is involved. Another pointless conversation passes and I let out a deep sigh. The only silver lining is that she hasn't suggested moving in yet. But then, tired of the same old routine, my mother-in-law says something unexpected during her usual dinner drop-in. As usual, Emily, this Christmas everyone's gathering at our place. She announces, her tone arrogant as ever. What? After your father passed away last year, we couldn't really do anything, right? I protest, feeling skeptical about her sudden change of heart. We've been relying on relatives from dad's side since the funeral, so I'm inviting them to our home as a way of saying thank you. She explains, as if it's the most natural thing in the world. Sounds exhausting. I reply, my enthusiasm lacking. I wonder how she plans to host people, especially when we've always gathered at her brother-in-law's or her own childhood home for Christmas and family reunions. She frowns at me, treating me as if I'm beneath her. You're not just a bystander here. You'll be helping too, she declares, expecting my compliance. What? Come over on the 24th and help clean up, she orders, stunning me with her audacity. Before I can object, she suggests using a baby carrier for Sarah, as if it's a simple solution. 
but you're also in charge of the full course Christmas meal. Don't you dare repackage store-bought food or cook anything that tastes bad. I don't want to be embarrassed, she warns, leaving me speechless. You can't be serious, I murmur, feeling overwhelmed by her demands. I'm thinking of inviting your dad's relatives on one day and my sister's family and our daughter on another. My mother-in-law muses, her tone suggesting a busy holiday ahead. Despite her complaints, I sense a happy aura emanating from her. Hold on, the one who's going to be busy is me, not you, she adds, reminding me of my duties as the daughter-in-law of this family's eldest son. Do your duty properly, L. she concludes, satisfied with her instructions, before leaving the meatloaf and heading out, leaving me stunned and my surprise some behind. She doesn't forget to pack the shrimp gratin that just needs to be baked. That night, when I tell Jake about it, he's as bewildered as I am. What? She's planning a party from Christmas Eve, inviting Dad's side of the family when he's not here. I express my frustration, finally losing my temper at Jake's predictable response. His face turns to an unmistakable uh-oh as he goes silent, realizing that this time, it's too much. All right, I'll handle the cleaning and entertaining the relatives. He resigns, his proposal giving me some direction. Really? I'm surprised by Jake's sudden cooperation, finding some relief in his willingness to help. But can you still cook the full course Christmas meal? He asks, hoping to preserve his mother's reputation intact. Um, just for this year, let's keep mom's reputation intact. Plus, everyone in the family loves your cooking. He pleads, staring at the meatloaf left by his mother. It's hard to say no after making a concession. Fine, just for this year. I agree reluctantly, preparing myself mentally for the task ahead. When I inform my mother-in-law that Jake will stay over to help with cleaning, she makes a displeased face, questioning my decision to let the man of the house do such tasks. However, she seems reasonably satisfied seeing Jake bustling around at his parents' home for my sake. And then comes Christmas lunchtime. Emily, is the corn soup ready? Jake asks. I'm preparing the croutons now. I respond, scurrying around the kitchen to get everything ready. You're so inefficient. I'll bring the food myself. My mother-in-law declares taking over. I'm sorry if you're going to complain, but try preparing a meal for 20 people. It's really, truly exhausting. I lament, finally taking a seat at the party. Jake seems to have put our daughter down for a nap in another room. Though preparing a full course Christmas meal for 20 people was challenging, it feels good to see everyone enjoying my cooking. However, that feeling of satisfaction doesn't last long. This quiche looks so beautiful. It's like something you'd buy. Someone comments. Thank you, I respond, brushing off the flattery. This carrot slaw is perfectly balanced with the vinegar. The orange scent really freshens up your mouth. Another compliments. That's because Christmas meals tend to be rich, so I made it a bit more acidic. I explained, trying to keep the conversation light. But something's off. Every time someone tries to compliment my Christmas cooking, my mother-in-law interrupts. Something is not right. I realize as the source of this awkwardness is revealed by Sophia, father-in-law's sister. Emily, mother-in-law, is such a great cook, isn't she? Sophie remarks. Excuse me? I respond, confused and dumbfounded. Unperturbed, chatterbox Sophia continues her story. Did Olivia make this entire Christmas feast? That's amazing. I haven't cooked a full-course Christmas meal in ages. I was going to leave it to my daughter-in-law but she's absolutely terrible in the kitchen and she never comes by, even when I offer to teach her. What? I'm left puzzled as mother-in-law talks about struggles she's never faced, as if they're a given. Oh, Emily, you should really take after Olivia while she's still well. Jake might miss the taste of home sometimes, you know? The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Daniel, a relative hanging around, remarks, seemingly mocking me. While mother-in-law smiles and feigns humility, I'm left astonished. As I stand there, she mouths, go along with it. Apparently, she's been claiming all my dishes, including the Christmas feast, as her own and sharing them with the family. Now she wants me to be complicit in her lie. No way, especially after she's been criticizing my cooking all this time. I want to speak out, but I'm overwhelmed by the crowd, 
finding myself speechless. My savior turns out to be my son. Mama's omelette is really tasty. It looks different than usual, but your omelettes are always good. His high-pitched voice echoes through the room, silencing the noisy adults. Oh my, this is actually a dish your grandmother made. Sophia tries to cover for my son, probably out of kindness. But my son responds astonished, huh? But it's tasty, so it's got to be mom's omelette. Grandma's omelette is super sweet and gritty. It doesn't taste good, he passionately insists gesticulating wildly, leaving the adults exchanging puzzled glances. Of course, my mother-in-law panics. Emily, don't teach the child to lie, she chides, but I can't hold back. Excuse me, who's the one lying here? Mom, am I a liar? Mike looks up at me, his face full of insecurity. That's when I feel my blood boil. I've put up with my mother-in-law because she's Jake's mom and Mike's grandmother, but a grandmother who turns her grandson into a liar just to save face is nothing but evil. If she's going to make my child a liar, I'll become a demon if I have to. Taking a deep breath, I straighten my back. Mike is not a liar. The one lying here is you, Grandma. I declare, shocking everyone, including myself. Standing up, I point dramatically at the table. I made this entire Christmas feast, including the corn soup. Everything from start to finish. Naturally, the room erupts. My flustered mother-in-law begins to panic and yell. Wait, 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 Emily. You've been lying this whole time. Have you lost your mind? I'm not lying, I assert firmly. Sophia, you said you got the pork belly stew from Grandma, right? Sophia, now pulled into this, looks up at me, surprised. Ah, yes, it was delicious. I made that too, huh? You're terrible, stealing credit for Jake's mom's cooking and trying to set her up. You're the worst daughter-in-law, I retort, feeling a surge of anger at my mother-in-law's attempt to take credit for my cooking prowess. Then can you tell me the recipe for the pork belly stew? Mother-in-law demands, caught off guard by my assertion. What can you, uh? She hesitates then, as if struck by inspiration, she shouts, it's a secret. It's a secret family recipe, so I can't tell you in public. You don't have to give details or measurements, just the basics. Even the relatives who were disgusted by our petty fight start to see who was in the right. Emily, that's enough, Jake's stern voice interrupts as he appears near the door, having finished putting our daughter to sleep. My mother-in-law clings to Jake, looking like a tragic heroine. Jake, what's up with your daughter-in-law? She's calling me a liar. That's awful mother-in-law protests, her mouth dropping open. Mom, you're the awful one here, Jake responds firmly. Emily made this entire Christmas feast all day while taking care of the kids. Trying to take credit for it is pretty low. Sophia, the only thing mom made is that massive bowl of creamy stew over there. Have you tried it? Jake continues, pointing out the creamy stew. Sophia, caught in the middle, looks visibly shaken. Is she recalling how incredibly sweet that stew was? I wonder aloud. Yeah, it was insanely sweet, wasn't it, mom? She thinks if it's sweet, it's tasty. She's always been cautious about salt and oil, but uses sugar with no limits. So all her dishes taste like a block of sugar. Jake explains, exposing his mother's cooking habits. So the pork belly stew was probably made by my daughter-in-law too. If you got any other dishes from mom recently, they were likely made by Emily. Jake concludes, shocking everyone with his revelation. Really? Even that meatloaf? That was me. And the mapo tofu and shrimp gratin. That was me, I add, feeling a sense of validation as the truth comes out. Mother-in-law, exposed for all her lies, panics. It seems like she's given up on lying and is now trying to appeal to Jake's emotions. Why? Why are you siding with your daughter-in-law? I'm your mom, she pleads, desperate for support. I didn't want to have to say this either, mom, but I thought you were just lonely because dad isn't here, so I've been having Emily put up with you. But this isn't anything but harassment towards her. There's no reason to protect you anymore. Don't see Emily or the kids ever again. Jake firmly dismisses his begging mother as he starts to clean up the Christmas feast. Then he apologizes to the relatives. I'm sorry for the disturbance this Christmas, Emily Mike. Let's go. Jake says, taking Mike's hand and standing up. Mike glances at mother-in-law. 
Grandma, where's your I'm sorry? He questions. When you lie, you say I'm sorry, then you get forgiven, right? Isn't that right, Mom? He asks. Mother-in-law clenches her lips tightly, clearly having no intention of apologizing. Seeing this, Jake sighs as if he's had enough. Grandma can't even say I'm sorry. And she's supposed to be an adult. How sad. Let's go home and have Mom's delicious Christmas feast, okay? He says, leading the way. We leave behind a growling mother-in-law and confused relatives, carrying our sleeping daughter and the Christmas feast as we head to my parents' place. Everyone is delighted and eats with joy. This is what I have been striving for, so my heart is full. Of course, Jake apologizes profusely and promises never to let us meet mother-in-law again. Apparently, the atmosphere at my house remains awkward as his relatives disperse, leaving only a soulless mother-in-law and some bland food. The next day, mother-in-law's sister and her husband, as well as Jake's sister, visit as promised. Seeing the bland food, they chuckle and say, figures. Apparently, mother-in-law's lack of cooking skills is a well-known fact among her relatives. So you brag about hosting a Christmas feast. I wondered what magic trick you'd pull. Probably just jealous of Emily, who's good at cooking and praised by Jake and Mike, they remark teasingly. Sorry for the inconvenience, they say after hearing the details from Jake. My sister-in-law thanks me for my efforts and Sophia also calls to apologize. I'm sorry for jumping to conclusions, Sophia says. It turns out Sophia also enjoys cooking and we bond over a recipe for braised pork belly. The misunderstanding with Jake is cleared up and I find new friends who share my cooking hobby. I felt refreshed enjoying a carefree Christmas. Of course, mother-in-law wasn't going to back down that easily, but I'm well prepared. As I'm making cornbread, my phone rings. It's mother-in-law. Excuse me, where are you? It's dinner time. Do your duty as a wife. She demands angrily on the other end of the line. Are you making the same mistake in coming over again? She adds, her tone furious. How dare you? I came here because you didn't apologize. Come home and clear the misunderstanding with our relatives, then I'll forgive you for embarrassing me, she continues. No thanks. You'll be the one left out by the family. That won't be a problem. To begin with, the one who put on airs and got shunned by the relatives was mother-in-law. I retort calmly. I've even made plans to cook with Sophia next time. I add, knowing it will sting. What? Mother-in-law is stunned, probably never imagining that I'd become close to father-in-law's side of the family. So what now? Still got any moves left? I ask, delivering another blow. Also, I'm not returning to that house, I declare firmly. What? Yes, the kids and I have been staying at my parents' house since Christmas. We're planning to find a new place to live now that the holidays are over. Initially, living near Mike's family was mother-in-law's strong insistence. But Jake's workplace is actually closer to my parents' house. I explain. Didn't Jake tell you to stay away from daughter-in-law? But since mother-in-law can't listen better than a child, we decided to physically distance ourselves. Right now, Jake is the only one living there, and he'll leave once he's ready. I reveal, adding insult to injury. What? Where are you? Mother-in-law's voice grows frantic. Who knows? You think you can get away with not cherishing Jake's mom? Yes, because Jake and sister-in-law have forgiven me. It's okay. Well, wait. What? Thank you for everything so far, mother-in-law. I'm so happy I'll never have to see you again. Goodbye, I say, ending the call with a laugh and blocking her number to ensure I never have to hear her voice again. Two years later, my family happily waits for my cooking in the living room, playing around as I fry the burgers in the kitchen. My heart warms up again today, watching them eagerly await my cooking with smiles on their faces.